Welcome to the Fitness Stuff for Normal People podcast. I'm Tony, and this week, without my co-host, Mariana, RIP, just kidding, she's fine. It's no secret, the fitness industry, the one we're in right now, it sucks. Whether it's the corrupt multi-billion, that's with a B, dollar supplement and weight loss industry, or the endless supply of influencers promoting absolutely anything to drive page views or just put a dollar in their pockets, the bottom line is we're not just trying to provide another fitness podcast, but actually change the fitness industry for the better. We want to do that by providing you with the knowledge and tools to give you the confidence in applying the best possible training, nutrition, supplementation, and habits into your own life, where today I'm riding solo, sitting down for round two with researcher Alan Aragon. Now, we met up with Alan Aragon in Los Angeles when Mariana and I had our podcast tour, but with a last minute flight change, Mariana could not make it. And that's why we're doing it solo, just Alan and I today. Now, if you don't know Alan, we did an episode with him a few months back where we covered, I think we, we agreed on about 80% of what you need to know when it comes to nutrition and body composition when we were covering his newest book, Flexible Dieting. Today, we did something a little bit different. We did a little round robin sit down where we spent about 15 to 20 minutes going deep into what's currently being talked about in the media from the CNN story linking artificial sweeteners to heart disease and stroke to the science behind seed oils in our health. That's a hot one today. BCAAs and even a new paper on vegan protein matching animal protein in muscle building potential. And we're going to go ahead and timestamp that out. So if you're more or less interested in one over the others, you can always skip around and move forward there. Before we get started, I got a quick list to go down though. First of all, and as always, I just want to say thank you so much. And I know I sound like a broken record, but thank you so much to those of you who take the time when you're listening to this intro, whatever it is, to leave us a five-star review on whatever platform you're listening on. Like I've said a hundred times, we don't have this massive production crew and filming crew and editing crew and all these publicists. We just have three people, myself, Mariana, and our awesome editor, Reagan, right? So we don't have these machines behind us and those five-star reviews naturally and organically push it out to more people, which is the goal that we have. So thank you guys so much. You really have no idea how much it helps move our podcast forward. Now, before we get started, as always, if you like the research aspect of what we bring into each episode, make sure to join us on the premium membership for the weekly fitness stuff research review that drops every single Friday, where we dive even deeper into specific studies, addressing individual nuances, showing you how to apply each aspect into your own specific lifestyle, while also teaching you more about how to read and interpret research. We also have some great things over there, like the monthly Ask Me Anything episodes, the exclusive partnership deals, like with Merrick Health, getting 10% off of your blood work and labs, and your own private podcast and research review feed. So much more going on. And the first month is just five bucks if you want to check it out. And we can't wait to see you over there. And before we jump into the interview that Alan and I sat down for, a quick word from two of our sponsors. The people that have been listening for a while, that, that might sound new. That might sound different. As always, Legion Athletics, the people that we love and have been rocking with since day one, right? We only recommend and mention a select few companies that we know work with the right work ethics and our research and evidence based and some that we've used on our own. Just to mention a few like Thorn, Legion, Now Supplements, and a few others. We wanted to give a special shout out to Legion, who is a proud sponsor of this podcasts. Now, other companies might be better at individual ingredient supplements, like Thorn is phenomenal for those higher dose individual ingredients, but Legion is the gold standard for sports supplementation. With all of their supplements third-party tested for purity and effectiveness and an entire scientific review board made up of MDs, PhDs, and other professionals vetting every single supplement, article, and podcast they produce. Now, I know I'm a big fan of their Whey Plus, which is a whey protein isolate, meaning they isolate the protein from the lactose and the unwanted carbs and fats to give you the best digesting and highest quality of form protein you can find in a supplement. I know I don't shut up about the honey cereal and I never will because right now that is my go-to. Along with their phenomenal pre-workout, I know if you listen to the pre-workout episodes, we tested all the top tiers and just based on the science, Legion is the only one that's clinically dosed in everything you need to maximize performance. Now, as always, you can get 20% off your first order or double points every order after that using code FSPOD at checkout on legion.com. And we'll put the link in our show notes below as well. Now, the second sponsor, this is actually the newest one 
of the show, but I can't think of a better time to introduce it coming off of what we just talked about for Legion. Now, if there's one thing we do not shut up about on this podcast, it's protein. Because whatever your goal is, if it's to get stronger, if it's to get shredded, to lose fat, or even just live a higher quality and longer life, protein is usually going to be the center of your nutritional goals. And one of the most commonly asked questions is without a doubt, what type of protein should you choose? There's over eight different supplemented forms to choose from. And everyone's got their own personal preferences about taste, about quantity. But we are partnering with the Strong Inside, which is an educational resource. They're not selling anything and we're not selling anything to you right now. They just want to help educate about the proteins from milk, specifically from whey. And this is why we line up with them so well is because they're education forward. They're not just doing anything for a buck. And this is really just because if you did not know, whey protein is a protein derived from milk and tested as the highest quality form of protein because it's a complete protein, meaning it contains all nine essential amino acids and is absorbed more quickly than any other type of protein out there. Something that you just don't get from a lot of plant-based proteins or other forms. And it's not just found in your whey protein shakes like the Whey Plus by Legion, but also added into protein bars and shakes and different recipes. Now, if you get to the point where I think everyone gets to where you realize you have to increase your protein intake to make whatever goal you have just easier, try and look for foods and supplements made with way. And today, I think more and more people are looking at the science and taking evidence-based approaches at finding the best protein for them. And the strong inside is just on a mission to educate about the benefits of complete proteins from milk. And once you get to the point where you decide you need to increase, the question is by how much, how much protein do you need? And it's not a one size fits all answer. So what we're going to do is plug down below the strong They have a sick protein calculator that takes into account your body weight, your lifestyle, your fitness level, your specific goals to give you a more accurate window that will help you get there quicker. So without further ado, let's go up for round two, myself and Alan at the Aloe headquarters in Los Angeles. Let's do it. Jumping in is always fun. So we'll just go ahead and get started. Our listeners know you. We were on, what did we calculate? Was it seven months ago? Seven. Seven. And both of our heads were like, oh, two or three months ago. Yeah. Seven months ago, yeah. Alan was on here. Seriously. Following the tail end of his book, really covering it was flexible dieting. Was there a subheading? Was that the complete title? Was flexible dieting? I, I don't have, actually have the subtitle of my own book memorized, which is amazing. But something about performance and health. Okay. Okay. Because I know that's what we really covered. And that's what we were both re-listening this to the first time a few months ago to see where we wanted to head today. We're like, okay, well, we kind of covered 80% of the bases. <laughs> so where do we want to yeah. hammer in this? Yeah. But now we get to dive into a little bit more of the specifics, which I guess before I jump in, we've gained a lot of listeners over the time. To those who haven't listened to the first episode, go do it after this. But do you want to give like a little cliff note version of who who's Alan? Sure. I'm one of the pioneers of the evidence-based movement in the fitness industry. And the capacity I'm operating at right now is doing research and finding better ways for coaches and practitioners in general, every, everyone from registered dietitians to personal trainers to even, you know, people more towards the clinical side to enable them to get their themselves and their, their clients and and in some cases, their patients better results. And so my colleagues and I, we've done a lot of the research pertaining to protein, protein intake, protein timing for adaptations like improving body composition, so fat loss, muscle gain, and improving athletic performance, uh, particularly uh, in the strength department. And so that's been my role in, okay. in, in the industry, yeah. Okay, so pretty big, which I was going to say, we geeked out a little bit on the first episode. We spent a long time going into, I remember just the start of your research review, which I, that's probably what I got the most out of the episode. I don't know if the, the listeners are probably like, tell me how to look good, but that's what I got the most, which I thought was the coolest part because we won't talk about that as much today. Cause you also, I mean, he's not joking about the pioneering part. You literally started a, the first ever, that style of research review, That's right. right? That's what we kind of just said. Like the first ever, like it just wasn't a thing mm -hmm. when you had kind of grown it it's been growing over the last is it 15 plus years yeah yeah 15 as of this past january yeah oh, so yeah. freaking for like 15 i don't even know where i was 15 yeah. years ago i was a teenager incredible so, yeah. my, my wife was just telling me so alan i can't believe you've been 
putting me through this stress at the end of the month, every month for the past 15 years. I'm like, <laughs> well, is that what it goes at? Like the deadline, the closer it gets to, it's like, okay, Alan's gone. He's locked away in the back cave. <laughs> He's in the back cave, making sure everything's good. Just being honest. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Which I was going to say, cause we have a lot of coaches who listen to, they get a lot out of it. Cause I'm like, and we recommend your research review. We've seen mass Bill Campbell started a really cool one, but this is always one. If we ever hear us talk about AARR, Alan Aragon's research review. This is kind of, he, that's him. He's, <laughs> he's the one, this is him, which if you're familiar with, I think if you're, especially in the coaching community, I'm like, you just would drive so much value from it. But Thank you. today we're going to dive into the weeds and we were sitting back chatting for a while before the episode. We're like, where the heck do we want to take it? Talked about like a dozen different things. We're going to start somewhere and see where it goes from there. Starting with a study that just got published, what, two, less than two weeks ago? Yeah. yeah on just, just fresh out for, yeah, on plant-based versus carnivore protein intake right so plant-based versus animal-based mm -hmm. protein intake which we on the show have talked about a handful of times we've never gone super deep deep into it i know mariana and i are talking about we're doing total like a total vegan diet review because she was actually vegan for three years a while back so she's going to peel back the layer on like the nutrient deficiencies the digestion issues things like that that she had to deal with but kind of go through and, and see it on both sides but specifically i think where people care about it is the protein now I was reading through this paper, but I want to get a better take on yours. So could you give a quick rundown of what this paper was? Mm -hmm. Just came out a couple weeks ago, so most people probably aren't familiar with it. Yeah. Give us a little cliff note version of the paper to start off, and then we can kind of dig, peel back the layers of it. Sure. This was by Montine, if I'm pronouncing that right, and colleagues. And their goal was to compare a completely vegan diet Mm -hmm. with an omnivorous mm -hmm. diet in subjects who were put through a progressive resistance training program. And they wanted to compare the adaptations to, to the training to see which protein was more anabolic and, and ergogenic. And so for the vegan group, they used a protein called, the brand name is corn, mm -hmm. I believe it's by Marlow Foods, who funded the study, mm -hmm. which doesn't automatically... <laughs> invalidate the study because it's you know industry funded but mm. anyways they they used corn products corn mycoprotein which is a fungus based protein and the omnivorous group used a different assortment of animal based proteins mm. to hit their protein targets and the strengths of the study were that they had a an abundant and in quotes optimal protein target it was, they was it 1.8 Per kilogram yep. of body weight? Okay. Indeed. They they assigned 1.8 grams per kilogram of body weight. And um, as we know, as far as the evidence goes today, that's that's pretty optimal for, mm. for most populations seeking size and strength. And even better, the subjects consumed somewhere between 2.1 to 2.3 grams per kilogram of body weight during the second phase of the trial. So mm. the first phase of the trial was a three-day phase that involved the assessment of myofibrillar muscle protein synthesis. So we're trying to look at growth at, at the micro level and compare I was going to say, can you break it down to like, I'm five listening? Because I'm like, for some <laughs> listeners, like, okay, cool. Right. Don't know what that means, but cool, I'm here. <laughs> but, uh, right. So I like, tell, tell, explain to me like I'm five before we move on for the people who, sure, sure thing. who are listening to. Sure thing. So muscle protein synthesis is a short-term indicator of muscle growth. And so that is our go-to metric to see what kind of a, a, an anabolic or growth response any given protocol or, or product in this case might have. Mm. And so they measured muscle protein synthesis for three days using a pretty sophisticated technique called the, the deuterium oxide technique. And indeed, there was no significant difference in muscle protein synthesis between the, the two diets, the, 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 the corn in, in, in quotes, Q U O R. -N. I know because I'm like every time I hear it, my brain goes corn, like the yes on the cob. But I'm like, okay, yes. no, it's it's the fungi protein. Okay, that's the brand name of the micro protein. Mm -hmm. uh, it's called corn with okay. Q U O R N, and so there was there was no difference in muscle protein synthesis between the the vegan group and the omnivore group, and that that's really interesting in and of itself. Yeah, and and then there was a second phase of the study that was ten weeks long that involved a progressive resistance training program mm -hmm. and they put the subjects through this and uh, the subjects ended up consuming almost a gram per pound of body weight in terms of a uh, total daily protein dose. Mm -hmm. The unfortunate thing about this study 
is that it's unable to assess the capability of this, this, parti- this particular incarnation of vegan dieting with microprotein supplementation. Mm. It's incapable of assessing it on its own because they put both of the groups on five grams of creatine per day. Mm. Yeah. So I was gonna say, is that a kind of a, do you see that as a flaw? I do, Mm -hmm. I do. And the rationale for using creatine in both subjects per the, per the author's explanation was to level the playing field. I was gonna I was gonna say, because they would obviously be consuming slightly less just through the plant-based diet. Yeah, they absolutely would, yeah. And so they wanted to level the playing field there. But here's my issue with that. Now we can only we can only extrapolate the results as far as people who are taking creatine mm. along with whatever they're dieting on. And so we're leaving out a large segment of the general population and some of the sporting population who isn't using creatine yeah. for one reason or another. Some people are involved with endurance sports where it messes up their power to weight ratio anyway. And it limits our generalizability of the results because they used creatine. And not only does it do that, but the effects of creatine when it works in the Mm. people for whom it works are very robust. And Mm. so you have a very large effect of creatine that could potentially mask the smaller effects of the differences in protein sources of the diet. And it's pretty frustrating because the main aim of the study was to compare vegan protein with animal-based protein. And so when you throw creatine in the mix, you introduce not only the confounding potential of masking the effects of the protein, but you also introduce the confounding effects of differences in creatine response across individuals. Mm. So with with creatine, there are responders and there are Mm non-responders. So non-responders for various reasons, Mm -hmm. you know, different fiber type distribution, different, uh, different genetics for various reasons. People, there are some people who just won't respond to creatine supplementation. And the way that they assess that is that they will only increase by 10 millimoles per kilogram. But here's the thing, assessing that involves biopsy and, you know, it's a, it just makes it so much more challenging because they they didn't do, they didn't do that in this trial did they no they didn't do it they didn't do it and what they could have done to you know avoid the the invasiveness and the non-feasibility and the general pain in the butt of 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 assessing that is they could have included a a third group of subjects who were not on creatine but then you have the issue of okay do we make this uh, third group of subjects on the uh, vegan diet or the omnivore diet so in my opinion they should have just left creatine out of the study yeah. Well, I was going to say at first glance, their reasoning, it's like, okay, I could kind of see that, but it's like, well, what's the goal in the first place of the study? Like, what's the goal? <laughs> right. That doesn't make any sense anymore, right? Like, why would they? Right. And okay. I, I've argued with, with people online about it and they default to, well, I don't know what you're, what you're complaining about, Alan. Everybody should be on creatine. Anyway. Okay. So, well, it's, it's like, that's like, not the, yeah, you're kind of covering up the problem. Right. Exactly. And so that is my, my big issue with that study and and in addition to that there was a study done uh, prior to this one by hevia lorraine and colleagues and this was done in 2021 this is the one we previously talked about correct yeah, okay right. cool cool okay that's right it's another study looking at resistance training looking at changes in muscle size and strength mm. between a fully vegan diet and an omnivorous diet and hevia lorraine assessed the effects of uh essentially soy soy protein supplementation in the, to okay. fortify the vegan diets to hit the protein target, which in that particular study was 1.6 grams per kilogram of body weight, which, which is a reasonable target mm. to try to uh, maximize resistance training adaptations. And so like, like they did not in- include creatine. So great. Kudos to them. <laughs> step, step one. But they used untrained subjects. That's okay. I remember this now. That's what we were covering about it. Yeah, so that is a limitation of the study. I even spoke with one of the authors who conceded that, yeah, that is a limitation. Of the Did study. they list that when they were going through limitations? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, that that's the thing. It's like when you use untrained subjects to test either a diet protocol or a training protocol, then you have the problem of these very large 
uh, newbie gains or much larger than you would see with resistance trained subjects. Mm -hmm. And so what happens is you get this masking effect of these robust newbie gains that happen regardless of potential differences or advantages in one protocol yeah. versus the other. And so unfortunately, with this latest vegan versus omni, st omni study that we're talking about mm -hmm. by Montine and colleagues, they didn't specifically recruit resistance trained subjects. The, the eligibility criteria for participating in the study was you had to have done six months of resistance training within the prior three years. Ooh. And so it's like, okay, that, that just makes it too broad. Yeah. It could be and, any, yeah, it could be anybody. You know, you're going to have a large degree of heterogeneity in training status across the individuals in the study. And that can just introduce some confounding variability between the groups. And it's like, oh, gosh, why didn't they? Yeah, they missed wow. the mark. Well, Because I was like, why would they? They would have had to know that going into it, right? Yeah. Or do you think it was just a, a kind of a blind spot? I think they considered it. Uh, but, you know, a lot of times when you put studies together, you think of what's feasible and what's not. And yeah. And you have time constraints. It's and, challenging. Yeah, it's really hard to, like, really put every piece, piece of the puzzle into it. So the broader you make the eligibility criteria, the easier it is to recruit subjects, just yeah. find people who can actually participate in the study. Okay. So what do you take from the newer one that just had come out? Because I know that's what I think most – this is the – I don't know if you agree with this, but the most common – I don't want to say attack, but the most common comment on the vegan versus meat-based protein is protein quality, mm -hmm. right? A gram of plant-based protein is not the same as a gram of meat-based protein. Mm -hmm. So people are saying quality-wise, it's not going to have the same effect. In this study, it looks like creatine might have screwed up. The, is, is that, did it really screw up like how we really could have seen where it stacks up in this scenario? That, that's the problem we'll never know <laughs> okay so i was like did it really screw it up like it really i was gonna say this seems like if they just would have left that piece out it would have been a really cool piece of data to look at it would have essentially been a replication of what heavia lorraine saw prior to it mm. and we would be able to co pretty confidently say in subjects who are not necessarily resistance trained then plant protein and a fully vegan diet can be on par, can can be okay. on the same playing field with an omnivorous diet yeah. with respect to muscle size and strength gains. Mm -hmm. But with creatine in the mix, the most we can say is, okay, well, a vegan diet, particularly <laughs> using mycoprotein mm -hmm. with creatine, is on the same <laughs> playing field as an omnivorous diet in mm -hmm. maybe recreationally trained subjects at best. Okay. So it did... That kind of hurts. It, <laughs> does. Hurts it to does. hear a little it bit. It bums me out. How well and, it could have know. been, and yeah, it's missed. Yeah. Which, because I think we actually, you had mentioned there were some pieces in the works. I think this might have been one of them. Correct. Last time, like, there's a few more that are going to follow up, and then this is probably one that came out about it. This but is, I, this is the one that we were hoping for to kind of close the debate a little bit. But it doesn't. It just opens a whole new. <laughs> makes it more more challenging, more complex, yeah. not less complex. That's right. Which is not what the goal probably was intended to be, but the. Conversation because we we really broke down a lot of the I think where most people see the get their ideas of plant-based and vegan is Netflix documentaries. Yeah, right game changers. I think what the health is the other one where It's almost hilarious when you break down the references they use and, and the claims they make it's just absolutely It makes you laugh almost and you realize oh crap This is how a lot of people consume nutrition education in this mm -hmm. country is through yeah. Netflix documentaries, but a lot of people go plant-based for Good reasons and bad reasons, ethical, non-ethical. Mm -hmm. When it comes down to it, we know, I mean, just from your episode, we're big fans of it, like how important protein really is. And just not even just the aesthetic, right? Everyone wants to look jacked and cool. But from a longevity standpoint, a quality of life standpoint, like a health span, not just a lifespan. If someone's going vegan or I even think a better idea is like to start introducing a little blend. It's not always black and white. You don't have to be 100% plant-based or 100% the opposite. Would you say this is more almost comforting to people who are worried about the quality of their protein not being as high. Like if someone's really doing it for whatever reasons, they really want to be more plant-based. Is it something they shouldn't worry as heavy, heavily about the quality discussion anymore? Or at least maybe if it's the right piece or where would you say, what would you say for them? Yeah, I, I would say that um, if you have casual goals, if you have recreational level goals for 
gains in muscle size and strength, uh, then you're fine. Mm. Um, it, it could come down to just total daily amount. And I still would err on the side of caution and consume a little closer to 2.0 grams per kilogram of body weight. That was the, the primary goal was muscle size and strength gains as a vegan. Okay. Um, and not, I wouldn't, you know, be running on 1.6 grams per kilogram of body weight on all vegan protein sources. Uh, if in, in fact, my goal was to maximize the adaptations mm -hmm. of resistance training. And so, but yeah, these, these two studies definitely support that. Okay. So they bring a little bit more comfort. Yeah. Instead of the camp who just says it's complete garbage, it's just complete trash. It's, it's terrible. Yeah. Those but, people are fun. But, but now uh, we're talking about casual and, and recreational trainees. Yes. Which is so, a very important distinction, I think, mm -hmm. for most people to realize. Like expectation wise, what is your goal specifically? Mm -hmm. So I think that was a really good yeah. adjustment of, of expectations. If, if the stakes are high and well, there are data showing that athletic performance between vegans and omnivores is, is kind of negligible. Okay. That's, that's fine. We'll give it that. But <coughs> if, you know, if that, I mean, for the faction of, of, <coughs> of the general audience or the competitive audience mm -hmm. who just wants to maximize muscle gains, muscle size and strength gains. And even in this in quote swap meat study, they showed a trend for greater strength in the animal-based protein group, mm. uh, then you may be striking a compromise between ideology and, you know, the, the actual yeah. the capacity for the agents to work maximally towards the goals. So going to be give and take, but which I think honestly is good news for a lot of people because I feel like most people are a little bit more, do have recreational goals. Or at least I know when we, when Marianne and I kind of really like, when people stem down their goals, like, okay, what do you really want? Because so many people will see the shredded dude on men's health or whatever and say, mm -hmm. okay, I want that. And it's like, okay, do you want everything that comes with that, right? Do you want the fatigue, the low energy, the poor sleep, the low libido? The, you know, everything that comes along, it's like it's give and take. Yeah. That comes with, like, I'm talking that next level. And people are like, oh, maybe I don't want exactly that, but maybe I could dial it back. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of people realize maybe it's closer to that recreational standpoint where there's not as much stress, which I think would be comforting for a lot of people to hear. Sure. But sure. if you're looking to get on a magazine, it might be a little... A little tough. It, it could be a little tough. And there's also the ultimate question of, okay, we're looking at a lifetime of dietary habits. Mm. You know, we're looking at uh, fighting the aging process from 40 years old to 80 years old. Mm -hmm. You know, who wins there? The omnis or the vegans? You know what I mean? And with me being uh, 51 now, I think I'm 51. Mm -hmm. Around there. Ballpark. Um, yeah, ballpark 51. I'm still not compelled to get on a, a vegan diet. Yeah. Just because I, I don't want to even incur the theoretical compromises thereof. So, yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, I was going to say, because sometimes in the conversation it gets lost where there's, for some reason, just some societal, like, high ground almost, right? Where it's like, okay, vegan is, there's benefits to this. There's all these benefits. It's like, okay, well, wait a second. No, it's not, it's not just a compromise. It's, I don't need to because it's not going to benefit. It's only going to potentially take away, mm -hmm. which it makes sense. Was I going to say, too, I know a lot of people really do, when they figure this out and they learn more about it, they're like, okay, if they are 100 or close to 100% plant-based, would you say, and I always think this is a good line to take, it doesn't have to be like the double edge. It doesn't have to be black and white. You can sprinkle in and start working it in more animal-based proteins. You don't have to ditch and abandon all plant-based protein sources, right? Like you don't have to, like the more animal-based in, probably the better just because it widens your your intake, right? The, the amount that's coming in. So I think that would be helpful for a lot of people to know. Is it's okay to open the scope a little bit, especially from a health standpoint yeah. going into it. And I was like, do we could open up? I was like, I'll give you the choice now. Do you want to open up the door and go deeper into vegan plant-based diet? Or do we want to shift to another deeper piece? And I'll give you the choice of either the three we had talked about. Seed oils, artificial sweeteners with the CNN article that just came out on erythritol, or BCAAs. Which BCAAs will be a short one too, so we can sprinkle that in whenever we want. You know, we better get on those because each one of those is like like a 20 minute I was going to say can of worms <laughs> so it's like okay we probably if we go deeper in the plant base okay so the, and, I like this I so. do I do want to give a shout out to my colleagues and, and my friends mm. in in the the plant based uh cult mm. <laughs> in the so, in, so, yeah, in so. the vegan mafia they're they're really some of the they're really some of the most well versed people in the space um, and and they're the the ones who gave me the most debate and the, mo the most pushback for even having the nerve to point out the limitations of the, the Montine and colleagues study. But 
Hey, man, sorry, guys. Limitations are limitations. we got to point them out. Well, yeah, every, they're, they're, every, they're a brilliant group. Well, they every are. piece of research is going to have limitations. Yeah. Every single piece. So it's like you can't That's pretend right. anything's perfect. Well, I'm like, That's we right. kind of need people like that to, or else we wouldn't really explore these areas as much. Is probably why, right? Like, you mm -hmm. need people like that. And it seems like, from what you're saying, they do a pretty good job of it. Yeah. Okay, so we'll t do we want to do a coin toss, or do you want to choose seed oils, or, more breaking, the CNN article about zero-calorie sweeteners, I just wanted to take the headline, linked to heart attack and stroke. Which one do you want to go with? The, the, let, <laughs> with the taller? Let, let's start with the, the sensationalism, and then we can go with the longer-standing sensationalism after that of the, the seed oil thing. Cool. <laughs> Okay, so let's go there. So we'll start with breaking headlines, yeah. CNN News, mm -hmm. everyone's favorite, a sugar replacement called, this is just from their article that shows, I love their, yeah. they word it so well, replacement called erythritol. Mm -hmm. Am I pronouncing that right? Yep. Okay, perfect. Used to add bulk or sweetened stevia, monk fruit, and keto-reduced sugar products has been linked to blood clotting, stroke, heart attack, and death, according to a new study. Okay, and this is the fun part because you hear that. And this is the conversation I was having with Mariana just this whole time, too, that we've been up here. When people hear study or research, most people, and it's, I'm even still learning and learning, but it's, it's learning a new language, learning how to read research. Mm -hmm. And that's something that most people don't have time to do. If you have a family, if it's easier because our lives are in health and fitness, so that's kind of everything that we do. But if you have a different job, a different life, you don't have time to start doing all this. So when you see a study, especially on a news source, Red flag goes off. Okay, artificial sweeteners are bad. I was like, did you have time to actually look at the piece of research that yeah. they were using? Okay, because I was like, I would love to talk about that and really show people what's happening here. Mm -hmm. Because, and I'll even let you kind of go through it, because they, they sorted, they, they cited one study, correct, about this. So that was the headline. What did the actual study look like from your point yeah. of view? So this study published in Nature Medicine, mm -hmm. it leans very heavily on the association between blood erythritol levels and cardiac events and cardiac disease states. Mm -hmm. And they did that by looking at populations. Uh, they looked at, uh, I believe, two, three, three, three or four cohorts, so three major cohorts. And they drew their conclusions based on not erythritol intake, that's what I was going to say. That was the biggest part. It, yeah. People get this confused. They weren't basing this off of how much of this artificial sweetener people were mm -hmm. taking in, just blood concentration of that, correct? Right. Okay. There's a huge difference. And here's the thing that, that people need to understand. There's a huge difference between an association between dietary exposure or, or dietary intake mm -hmm. of a given agent like erythritol and disease states versus blood lipids of erythritol and disease states. And mm -hmm. this is particularly important in the case of erythritol because erythritol, not only is it naturally occurring in various foods in nature and mm -hmm. fruits, you know, in, in glucose and fructose sources mm -hmm. in nature, but it's also produced endogenously. So yeah. it's, it's produced within the body. Yeah. And so in various disease states, cardiovascular disease states in particular, it's entirely possible and it's actually been demonstrated that the body ramps up its erythritol yeah. production in response to disrupted glucose metabolism mm -hmm. in uh, disease states that are essentially the product of massive excess of calories over a period of months or years or decades. And these cohorts that they examined were just very sick people, cardiovascular. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And they, lo and behold, happened to have Elevated erythritol what? levels. <laughs> but erythritol production within the body is a, a so-called... Er, erythritol is a downstream metabolite of glucose metabolism. So it's a product okay. of glucose metabolism within the body. And uh, when you're cardiovascularly diseased, then there's something called the pentose phosphate pathway mm -hmm. and the activity of that is ramped up. It's just a, this is a known thing. Mm -hmm. And what gets spit out through the PPP pathway is erythritol. And so making the leap that these people <laughs> with <leap>. car cardiac <laughs> events, cardiovascular disease, they have high blood erythritol levels. Therefore, eating foods with erythritol in them is going to take your ass out. Yeah. 
that is just an incredible, incredible leap of, of faith. And not only that, but we have data showing that erythritol in, in tightly controlled, in, in studies that actually examine <laughs> erythritol consumption mm. and the effects of them, the direct effects of them, show positive effects on mm. Mm. cardiovascular parameters. And, and the, one in particular that sticks out is in a vulnerable population, type 2 diabetics, mm. who already have dysregulated glucose yeah. metabolism. Consumption of erythritol in these type 2 diabetics, yeah. it improved in the short term in, a, in acute data, it improved endothelial function. So we're talking about the, the flexibility of the vascular yeah. tissues and the function of the vascular tissue. One of the first things that type 2 diabetes impacts. Endothelial function improved uh, acutely. And really? um, on a chronic basis of erythritol intake, aor aortic stiffness decreased. <laughs> okay, see, that I didn't know about when I was breaking down. I had no freaking clue. Are you serious? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and so we've got data that direct experimental, tightly controlled data that contradicts this wild leap of faith, honestly, that is being made by the uh, Nature Medicine study. And the platelet aggregation or the platelet activity that they got all up in arms about, I mean, this is stuff that's done in the test tube. This mm. is stuff that's done outside of the body. And this is testing markers of platelet aggregation. And it's like, um, I, I forget which, which research said this, that like you can make anything you want happen outside of the body in a test tube. Seriously, yeah. <laughs> what matters is comparing dietary exposure with the subsequent effects. And that absolutely was not done in this latest study that is just lighting up the, the media. I was going to say that first, the, the piece that you mentioned about type 2 diabetics, when they actually looked into it, I'm like, for some reason, I don't think, I think I missed that article on CNN that covered that. <laughs> yeah. That paper oh, that yeah. came out. I think I missed that one yeah. for some reason. Because, but you know what I'm saying? Like, that's where people see study finds and it's like, okay, this is gospel. Whatever, whatever comes next is gospel because a study supported it. It was on CNN, dude. That, that's what I'm saying. Not even just a random little person on Instagram or something like yeah. this. This is CNN doing this. And I forget if the, because I, I only read it when the first day came out. The CNN article hadn't mentioned hardly anything about the particular study, correct? They were just going more into the details the, of the what, yeah, the conclusions, which I'm like, it stinks to see because if you're, again, not in this industry, you shouldn't have to look so deep to, to find like the true meaning of this kind of stuff, right? No. You, sh you shouldn't have to look that deep. There is a potential negative consequence of, of these headlines and these, uh, you know, this stuff getting put out there virally in the mass media. And it's because there's a bunch of products that have erythritol as, as a sweetener or one of the sweeteners on the ingredient list. Mm. And these products are essentially designed to help people cut back on their added sugar yeah. Intake. Beneficial for most people. And you know what? If, it, if people are cutting back on added sugar, they're cutting back on caloric intake, and then they're cutting back on the prime culprit for cardiovascular disease, which is excess total caloric intake and the excess accumulation of body fat, which leads to the excess accumulation of abdominal fat. So mm. technically visceral fat and ectopic fat, the accumulation of these things causes insulin resistance. And then insulin resistance is your one of your direct pathways to cardiovascular disease and ischemic heart disease. And ischemic heart disease is the number one cause of death yeah. in, in worldwide. <laughs> Out of all the causes of death, you've got <laughs> so right ischemic there. heart disease, bam, to, up there at number one, even above strokes, even above infectious diseases. It's And so when people are like, oh, gosh, now i got to kick out all the erythritol from my diet, they'll look up lists of fruits that have the highest erythritol that kick out those fruits. They'll see products that are, that would function normally perfectly well to help them cut back on sugar and calories. And they go, Oh, erythritol, I'm not going to use that. Toss it. And then, yeah, after they toss everything out, what's yeah. left? What's right. left? It's like the stuff that we were trying to avoid. In the, the stuff you're trying to avoid. Which I'm like, this isn't an over, I don't think this is being overstated. Cause I think people are like, okay, it's, it's going to lead. It's like, this is what the domino effect happens when yeah. you go down this route. In public health, because a lot of people are like, oh, it's CNN, whatever, we'll just toss it out. It's like, this has some real life impact, which I don't think will be right now, but years to come, just because this is not the first time this has happened. This is a pretty common trend, you know? It's it's pretty common. Oh, it's like, this was you a... don't notice the, the damage it's doing now. You're not going <sighs> to notice for another 5, 10, 20 years where it becomes big. Because that was one of the pieces where, and this is why, again, I don't, this is not a, a plug thing. Follow people like Alan. Follow researchers who can actually do that work for you. Because you shouldn't have, you shouldn't know, I don't, unless your opinion is different. I don't think the average American should have to 
spend the amount of time looking into every single sided source going into and they don't they shouldn't so that's my standpoint i'm like follow people who do this on a regular basis before you take any actions because yeah erythritol is a widely used product instead yeah. of just tossing everything in the in the pantry mm -hmm. yep yep exactly right okay that, that's where i wanted to take that one that was fun i was like we got to talk about this piece good, good do you have any i'm trying to think if i want to put a, do you want to put something else on that before we move on to i like this little sectioning well, uh, the conversation about artificial sweeteners is, as a whole, as a whole, okay, it's it's important to to talk about because um, there is some nuance to it that doesn't necessarily get discussed. Mm. But one of the big things and one of the big uh, cautions and scares, scaremongering that goes on with artificial sweeteners is their supposed negative effect on the gut microbiome and their effect on glucose control and insulin response and all that stuff. And really, there's there's only we can't look at artificial sweeteners as this single monolithic unit. Mm. There's different artificial sweeteners with different biological effects, and the one that stands out as having the most consistent, unfavorable biological effects in terms of glucose control, and even in terms of potentially effects on negative effects on appetite that would allow people to uh, eat more calories, mm. is saccharin. Mm -hmm. So saccharin is one of the oldest artificial sweeteners that hit the market. And because of these negative effects and because of public outcry and kind of the virality of information, negative information about saccharin, a lot of uh, food companies have phased it out. So saccharin is, you know, if you were born in the 70s or 80s, you'll, you'll remember in greasy spoon restaurants, you've got the pink packets of sweet and low. Mm. So you got sweet and low, you got Splenda, you mm -hmm. got regular old sugar. So the pink packets of sweet and low are saccharin. And uh, saccharin is most consistently shown to have these negative effects on just various biological parameters. So I, I wouldn't give my thumbs up to saccharin. Okay, so that's the one that's not getting the green card. Yeah. Is, a, is any of the data on saccharin, is there an abundant amount of like translational data like in humans? Or is a lot of it in vivo in rodent studies is it or is there is this the one that actually is starting to have a little bit more of an effect like when we look at it in humans it has a small amount in humans but it's enough to give us some pause because it corroborates what we've seen in the uh, rodents okay on and but with both lines of research you give people absurd doses of this stuff mm. so if somebody honestly just takes down one or two packets of of sweet and low in their in their coffee at their favorite denny's or whatever mm -hmm. They don't really have anything. They have bigger problems. To about. <laughs> yeah, it's like we're we're tripping over yeah. these little pebbles right now. Right. If they're in IHOP, you know. Yeah. <laughs> but if you're down at yeah, you got it. You're down at a twelve pack of diet, diet cut, even though it's more because I know aspartame is the one people worry about the most. I think. Yeah. From what what's in the media, it seems like aspartame for some reason that's got the red X on its back. Yeah. Yeah. That's in and, there. And you see that that the food manufacturers are responding to consumer uh, negativity, consumer resistance, as far oh, as yes. aspartame goes, and you see it disappearing more and more. From products and what we're we're seeing kind of remaining we got sucralose in there you got stevia in there ace k is still in there mm -hmm. but these things are are just minuscule factors in the diet compared to the more negative and more adverse thing that you could be doing which is over consuming calories and a bunch of added sugars mm -hmm. so they're the far lesser of the two evils and uh the weight of the evidence would point them towards even just being completely neutral mm -hmm. okay so completely in the big picture Okay, so overall, and I think that's always the part that should come after it, is like, okay, like, what are we really, th there might be something here, but it's like, okay, in the grand scheme of things, like, how big of a puzzle piece is this? Just one tiny corner piece, or is this half the puzzle, which, like you're talking about, it's not. <laughs> so, okay, so as a whole. And for weight loss in particular, mm. artificial sweeteners are effective. Mm. The, 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 yeah. The grand scheme, the weight of the evidence shows that they are effective for weight loss, and you know what? Controlling body weight controls a constellation of negative health effects. And if that's the way to do it, you know, our little Frankenstein sugar compounds, if that's mm. the way we get there, then that's fine. And, you know, in this ideal utopian way, sure, you in, in, encourage people to just consume more plain water. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Are we forgetting like, what else exists? Plain water. Consume it. You know, let's, let's, let's endorse it right now. 
Big water guys. Maybe you know, not we're... the maybe not the the alkaline style. Oh. I'm not no, no I'm like the hey, water hey. yes, but I'm like yeah, I'm like oh crap, this is the pH. Now they're using the pH it's sales little, line. It's a little fancy, but the it, alkaline. It, it, can be, it can be plain water. Yeah, just drink water. That's what we like. <laughs> Diet Coke or Coke. There's other things. There's other things that exist. And if you want something sweet, have some fruit. You know, so that's kind of this utopian thing that mm. not necessarily realistic. And if we need to use food technology. To get to a place where we can control excess caloric intake, then hey, artificial sweeteners it is. If it ends up being one or two uh, diet drinks a day, fine. Better than having mm. the full caloric versions of it. A couple extra hundred calories. Yeah. yeah it, it, of regular, which kills me. Which up here, that conversation actually happens a lot. Los Angeles is a different world, is what I'm learning. It <laughs> <is>. <laughs> than the rest. It's a little separated. Yes, we're in the heart of LA. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Because artificial, because this is what I was like, that's one of those things that I feel like I, I see. People online extract and twist more than almost any other topic. Mm. Used to be, I think, carbs. But now I think I see this artificial sweetener topic where, and I want to get your take on this too, because you read through research probably more than anyone I've talked to in, in my life. But <laughs> when I read through a lot of it, I almost see some of the titles of these studies, especially with artificial sweeteners, not accurately representing the data or the findings in the actual paper. Have you noticed that at all, where the, the, the findings or the abstract or the conclusion where I've had to reread several times, I'm like, that's not what I would have thought came next. Mm -hmm. and I'm like, okay, I probably missed something because I'm not as smart as these individuals doing this. But you reread, and I feel like there's a little bit of a, it's even seeping into some of the research. Right? Have you noticed that with artificial sweeteners or no? I've noticed that with a bunch of different topics in research. Mm. It's because just we as humans, we've got egos and we have that innate need to kind of bol bolster our social standing and our our place in history. Researchers, I mean, they, they need to find a way to justify the the blood, sweat, and tears that they put in for like almost no money. Yeah. And so there's a tendency to want to report a breakthrough. There's a tendency oh, okay. to want sense. to report some novel findings that add meaningfully or even upset the, the whole paradigm, mm. flip the paradigm, upset the apple cart mm. uh, of what we know. And so there's a tendency for researchers to kind of reach for that. And, and a lot of times they overreach, uh, and okay. especially in terms of their interpretation of their results or their neglect for uh, naming off and discussing the limitations of their results. And so, yeah, researchers, they're, they're just people who want to. They're just people. Like, they're, they're not so much different than you or I. They kind of want the spotlight. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Which I'm like, it's always kind of, because you can empathize with almost anybody, I think, right? Like any, anybody making any claim, any find anything. And so you can empathize a little bit where it's like, okay, if I was in that certain scenario, I haven't lived their life. Yeah. You, you'd be prone to do something similar probably to them too, right? Mm -hmm. Under the certain circumstances, I'm not saying it's right or wrong, but it's easy to kind of say it's because that makes a lot of sense, right? All this work, life's work. And it's like, you just kind of want, you want something. Yeah. And I don't even think they probably don't even knowingly do it almost. Right. You know, it's, it's right. like, they probably don't see it until years later. Like, oh crap. I I did that. It's this human need to want to have your name in the history books. Yeah. You know? Who doesn't want that? Yeah. Who doesn't want that? <laughs> <laughs> a little bit. A little bit. Okay. So that so that kind of hits that. Was that that was a good cherry on top. Are we ready to tackle the, the big one? The seed oil. The seed oil is the big one. <laughs> this is pro would you say this is the biggest one that you see? The seed oil conversation. It, it, it's the maybe it's the biggest fight on, on online. I mean you got you have people just tearing each other apart over it yeah. and, and, and you know you see enemies being made over this this seed oil topic but there's a lot that's weaved into it because it gives people who take like a, a keto stance or a carnivore stance it gives them a target to just vilify because hey seeds are plants <laughs> right yeah. and so uh it also uh, it's an interesting story that's easy to to get entertained by the sensationalism behind it. Because, like, imagine if we just found the smoking gun that's ruining the health <laughs> That we've of been the looking world. for for decades. <laughs> ruining the health of the Western world. Let's mm. not make it complicated and say it's multifactorial. Yeah. No, let's, screw that. That can't be right. <laughs> let's not talk about the hyper palatability of highly engineered, ultra processed foods that combine refined carbohydrates and fats. Couldn't be that. And, Couldn't be. You know, and, and are perfectly flavored and, and are just highly just. <laughs> delicious um, <laughs> creations, right? Engineered foods. Let's think of something much more simple. How about seed oils? Mm -hmm. And the irony of that is you 
are hard pressed to. Okay, I'll, I'll take a couple steps back. The people who blame seed oils for the ills of humanity are relying on mechanistic data. Mm-hmm. Uh, they're relying on rodent data, if if at best, mm-hmm. and they're ignoring human health outcome data. Okay, and that is the probably the biggest issue and the biggest uh, knock against the the people who are scaremongering against seed oils. Mm. And you can do this any day of the week. You can say, mm. "All right, so number one, let, let's assume." That the different species of plants in nature have different biological effects. Are you okay with that? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. Cool. Now, what seed oil is the culprit? Mm. You know, because we can't possibly say. Yeah, that you're taking all the seed oils are just yeah. bad, right? One hundred percent. That's the biggest flaw in so many arguments. The carb argument. The, there's. It's not one thing. It's a hasty generalization where you lump, like even artificial sweeteners, lump them all together. Okay, seed oils, lump them all together. Okay, wait a minute. Let's talk about this in an organized way, Mm -hmm. right? So which seed oil is the bad guy? Mm -hmm. Or name one of them that's the bad guy. Yeah. Canola oil. (laughs) Okay, cool. Let's let's look at the canola oil Mm -hmm. research. And let's do even better. Let's look at the human research (laughs) and the effects of canola oil. Mm -hmm. And let's try to find unfavorable or adverse effects or just clinically negative, like bad stuff. Mm -hmm. Okay. Time goes by. (laughs) PubMeds get flown around. Oh darn! We we just can't <laughs> we can't really find anything. In fact, ninety plus percent of the data is positive mm-hmm. in terms of uh, both intermediate effects and like you know blood markers of health mm. and hard endpoints, hard outcomes too, like disease endpoints. All of it's positive with respect to canola oil. Okay, from the controlled stuff to the observational stuff, all in humans. Oh gosh! Well, with any other compound, we would have to take a look at mechanistic data that potentially uh, indicts the the substance or the agent in question Mm. and we'd have to kind of go okay well that doesn't apply here but people are unwilling to face the human data showing positive health effects from canola oil and some people will even claim canola oil it's you know it'll cause weight gain and you know it'll cause insulin resistance and all this stuff okay well let's take a look at that show me (laughs) that show me where please show me where okay there's a meta-analysis showing that canola oil actually biases the results towards weight loss so there's a trend towards weight loss not that one not not that one (laughs) this is a multi randomized control meta-analysis and so the best that we can say with the seed oil thing is that you can't take a, a, a an isolated mechanism, an isolated biochemical process, and make the leap that because seed oils contain this particular chemical, and we're talking about omega-6 mm-hmm. fatty acids, you can't simply ha- take this reductionistic view and make these leaps of faith mm-hmm. that what's going to happen at the human disease level is the same thing as saying, Omega-6 fatty acids are a precursor to arachidonic acid, which sets off the inflammatory cascade. We can't say that because guess what? We've got foods that don't just have omega-6 fatty acids. Mm -hmm. We have a multitude of other compounds. And we'll take nuts, for example. Try to find research showing negative health outcomes of nut intake. I dare you. You're looking for a little (laughs) little longer. (laughs) Nuts are... Mostly the, the predominant, I mean, they're a mix of fatty acids, mm-hmm. but most, if not all, of the widely studied nuts like walnuts, um, almonds, pecans, etc., on down the line, mixed nuts, they're high in omega 6 fatty acids. However, you only see favorable effects on cardiometabolic parameters. Yeah. And honestly, same thing with canola oil. <laughs> and so, what people are looking at, they're taking the old trans fatty acid um, situation Mm. where uh, like partially hydrogenated vegetable oils have been banned since I think 2015 Mm. Uh, because when you partially hydrogenate vegetable oil you create trans fatty acids which uh, cause adverse changes in blood lipid profile and this has been seen consistently consistently and so to the point where the health agencies say okay we're just gonna ban that Mm -hmm. okay good that was a good move however People are just still stuck on the idea Mm. that seed oils are the culprit when in reality, the vehicle of those seed oils is when it is, when we do see an adverse outcome, that is the culprit. Yeah. It's the context. It's the ultra processed food that 
houses the seed oils. That's getting you. It's yeah. not specifically canola oil or specifically, you know, sesame oil. Oh, my God. Speaking of sesame oil, do a PubMed search on the health effects of sesame oil. Try to find something negative. Mm -hmm. It's all positive. Yeah. Well, the a Asian folks knew that for <laughs> <laughs> the beginning yeah. of recording. Like looking history. back and we're like, what are y'all still talking this about? What are you still talking about this for? Is he okay? So, but I'm like, okay, that problem seems to be the one that almost every single one of these trends that pops up runs into is a mechanism jumping leaps and bounds to mm -hmm. come to whatever outcome it is. And that's what we try and hammer so hard on all these. But I'm like, it, it, look at every single like the artificial sweetener conversation, the plant based conversation, like the, the whole hate campaign on red meat, right? Yeah. It's the same thing where it's yeah. like, okay, when you compare plant based versus red meat in the American diet, it's like, well, let's look at the American diet first. It's not there. Okay, so I was I was excited because I was kind of coming into this more as a student on the seed oil conversation. Because like I was telling you, I'm like, this isn't in my circle of competence. I really don't know specifics of it. But I was like, it seems like what I was telling you before, my stance seems semi close to it, right? It's not the individual piece that's the problem. It's that the diet rich in these things is also going to be rich in everything else that's going to be potentially inflicting this pain. Right. Yeah. Like that's, it's kind of, but that's the whole thing. And it's, and people try and point these, these dangers. And that's why it's so easy, I think, for the public to get zoomed in on whatever small thing is the next problem. If it is artificial sweeteners, if it's seed oils, it's easy to get so zoomed in on it. But it's like when you really, it's hard to take a step back and realize, okay, wait a second, wait a second, wait a second. Like everything else going on matters mm -hmm. a lot. Everything else going on matters a lot. So I think that's a conversation with seed oils. It's just one of those things. Would you tell most people again? Is it one of those things where you? I think in the first conversation we had, we kind of tried to categorize things as like, okay, what should we be like? What should we really give our attention to, and what should we not? What's not a waste of? Would this be more on the other side, like what not to give your attention to? Yeah. Not saying there's nothing that like the like the saccharine conversation. Mm -hmm. Not that there's nothing there, but it's like, is it worth your attention if you're really truly concerned about your health, your performance, your aesthetic, anything else? Would you say it's not worth? your attention or energy right now? It's not a concern. Most oils out there that you could run into just living life, going out to eat, mm. are not going to be great oils. They're used over and over in restaurants. They refry and they just, you know, you're eating some low quality <laughs> stuff. If you proactively, like at home, if you prepare your food, if you use oils that are known to consistently have positive health effects, like extra virgin olive oil, mm. then that would be a better practical uh recommendation or a better just purposeful thing to do mm. rather than just being paranoid of seed oils for no reason uh, i mean gosh and even in the research that they compared polyunsaturated fatty acids with saturated fatty acids in in an overfeeding type of situation a caloric okay. surplus type of situation i think it was Roz quist and colleagues who did this if I'm not messing up the authors. But anyways, uh, people know it as the muffin study. <laughs> um, <laughs> not like that. That's how I remember it, yeah. <laughs> the muffin study. And so in hypercaloric conditions, stained mm -hmm. hypercaloric conditions designed to put body weight on, saturated fats actually resulted in a greater accumulation of, of visceral fat compared to uh, the polyunsaturated <laughs> omega-6 rich, you know, what would be in seed oils. Mm -hmm. uh, that, that resulted in actually more lean body mass gain and <laughs> and significantly less uh, adverse type of uh, fat deposition compared to the saturated fat group. And so there's even direct experimental evidence that shows that, gosh, seed oils might even be healthier. There's actually a few lines of evidence showing that omega-6 fatty acids are actually healthier than saturated fats just as a general group okay i was about to ask you that next next again just from not knowing too much about this subject going into it i'm like it almost seems like it's not only not as bad as everyone's <laughs> saying it's it's the opposite not okay maybe bad. not magical right sure. not but but even not just not bad but potentially beneficial there's plenty of consistent evidence showing that replacing saturated fats with polyunsaturated fats which are almost inevitably omega-6 containing or omega-6 dominant mm. uh more favorable health outcomes occur. And this is not as consistent a finding as when you replace saturated fats with the other kind of um, polyunsaturated fat, the omega-3 fatty acids, which are kind of the darling of the, mm. you know, the, the health outcome yeah. uh, world. There's a little bit, bit of an issue with, um, with fish oil and atrial fibrillation, but I don't know, the, mm. the lipidologists are kind of working that out right now. <laughs> 
but it's not as if people who eat fatty fish their whole life are dying of atrial yeah. fib related stuff. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, we don't have to hold yeah. <laughs> production on all our, all our omega 3s. Yeah. So, so now w- with saturated fat, just kind of an offshoot of that topic, there, there is some nuance there too. Like full fat dairy, which is saturated fat rich, does not appear to be a, a major threat. It mm. mostly has biologically neutral effects on health. It, Neutral to positive, in fact. Mm -hmm. And that's because a food is more than just it's the fatty acids it contains. Yeah. So there's the so-called food matrix to consider with something like dairy that has saturated fat in it. But hey, lo and behold, the full fat versions, they don't necessarily contribute to disease outside of context where you're just over-consuming total calories. Yeah. If you're ignoring the bigger picture. (laughs) It feels like that's, that feels like it ends up with a lot of things. Yes, sir. Okay, because that's uh, we always hammer at home. It's like the mechanism and now they, they're not always the same thing. But I feel like, do you rack your head? I, okay, now actually, we just want to know this personally. I don't know where you consume your where, like from the outside world. If you spend time on social media, news outlets, you ignore everything and just go sit in the dark, like Aaron Rodgers, just lock yourself in a cave for three days in the darkness. <laughs> yeah, that was crazy. That he, I think he just did that to make his decision about a sports team, right? Does this frustrate you? Or, I mean, you've been here for a long time. Like you've been here for a long time. Yeah. Does it frustrate you when you see this being the what most of the public is seeing is just so blatantly just not what it looks like in real life? Does that concern you? Because it feels like from the outside, it looks like you're unfazed and you continue doing what you believe to be true, yeah. the right thing to do. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Is there something on the inside that, <laughs> that you just kind of like bite your tongue a little bit? <laughs> like when you see this or I just I, I got to know there, like, or do you do you try not to even look at it or pay attention to it? I think that the the. Okay, it doesn't bother me all that much Mm. because a lot of the crazy things that people do following the health trends, um, it sometimes it ends up giving them better health anyway. So, Mm. like, if somebody is absolutely paranoid of seed oils, (laughs) they'll end up eating less calories. They'll Mm -hmm. cut out all the foods that they find may may have some omega six containing oils. They'll cut it out, uh, and they'll get healthier anyway. Mm. Uh, They'll do it in an ignorant and diluted way. But they'll get healthier, healthier anyway, and yeah. I think that and that's the um, goal, right? Those are the the different roads to Rome. I I think that uh, the bigger problem is when people start vilifying foods that have a really good track record for causing very favorable clinical effects and or performance effects, and they mm-hmm. start vilifying them and saying you got to avoid that, you got to avoid carbs, you got to mm-hmm. avoid fruits, so you got to avoid you know. Where yeah. taking those things away really could have some yeah, down-the-road yeah. implications. Down-the-road down um, negative health impacts, yeah. Okay, that makes a little bit of sense, which I know we had, I think it was, I think it was actually with Mike, with Mike on the show too. We were kind of talking about it where it's, you know, we have the conversation, I think just the, the vehicles that you use to get to successful, like to, to achieve whatever health. And it's like if you go to someone who just lost 100 pounds on keto mm-hmm. and you try and change their mind by showing them a, a systematic, whatever, you shove it in their face, that's not going to change their mind. Yeah, they just lost a hundred. They've tried every diet in the world. Nothing's worked. They just lost a hundred pounds on keto. Oh, look at my, re- no one cares. Like that, that's not going to yeah. care. But mm-hmm. at the same way, it's like, yeah, what, what do you define as like mission accomplished? A healthier planet, healthier. Pe- it's like, yes. It's like, okay. Are, is everyone healthier? Oh yeah. It's like, okay, well maybe I don't need to be as harsh. You don't need to completely get them to jump to your circle, but maybe just widen the circle a little bit, you know, Sure. let everyone in a little bit, which I think is hindsight always kind of nice to keep in track, which might be a good segue. Talking about Mike, because we talked about this one. I, don't, I just plug Alan to follow just because he's hilarious. The BCA conversation, yeah, which we talked about a lot. We could have segued this from the, pro, the, the plant-based protein mm-hmm. conversation, but it's never a bad place to put it in. Because people, for some reason, I've been talking about it for years. Everyone seems to have been talking about it for years, but it's still one of the hottest selling supplements on the market. But the supplement company, as we know, is not the most trustworthy people to listen to. Which, okay, which total sidetrack rabbit hole. We were talking about this. We were digging down on different stories. Not only we were talking about the BCA conversation, which we'll mm-hmm. dive into in a sec, but looking into the history of certain supplement companies like USP Labs finding Prozac in their fat burning stuff, like the antidepressant. Yeah. Were you familiar with that? In 2015, they had a shaky year with everything going on, it seemed like. That, that, that story just floated across my desk real fast, and I didn't actually dive into it. Okay. Well, I, it, usually things, it's like, okay, they have different amphetamines, DMMA. It's like, that's not good, but I'm like, but then something like Prozac, a prescribed antidepressant, you're like, why? Like, why is this here? That's intense. Right? But the, the supplement industry is not there for your best interest most of the time, most of the time. 
Uh, when it comes to BCAAs, I know, and the only reason I'm sharing this too is because Mike had said this on our show, like publicly too, with Legion, it's the number one most requested supplement they add on because he's always looking for consumer feedback. Like, what do you guys want? Where can I help fill a gap? And BCAAs has been there for years. He's like, I'm, no, like I'm just not doing it because the science is very, very clear. Doesn't add anything on top. He was even saying how many millions of extra revenue like they could bring in. He's like, no, it's just not, not going to do that. Yeah. So... And the, the only reason I'm talking about this with Alan is because he had a hilarious post about a Olympic swimmer pouring water on himself in an Olympic sized swimming pool. Right. And it was, what was it? Taking BCAAs when you're getting enough protein through your diet anyways, essentially, which made me laugh. Uh, but let's talk about BCAAs for people who don't understand, because here's the conversation that I want you to bridge. Whenever we make the conversation, we say, okay, when you're consuming enough protein, BCAAs, you will not have any notable effect across performance, recovery, any metric that they advertise as, right? None. Mm -hmm. But people immediately say that and they say, okay, well, if I'm not getting enough protein, then I should take them, right? And it's like, no, 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 no. <laughs> we're, we're missing the stuff here, right? Is that, where do you see the biggest gap? Why people aren't getting this piece of, of BCA is just not being a supplement. It's because people have this enamorment with the idea of amino acids being the building blocks of protein and if they're in free form, then they immediately just hurry over to the muscle tissue, you know? That's how it works, right? <laughs> when when they're, they hurry over to hunger muscles without hesitation. Mm. Um, it's just not true. And, and it's really interesting how BCAAs are among the top four most used supplements amongst competitive bodybuilders. And this was reported by... Could have been by Andrew Chappelle and his group, mm. but this is in the peer-reviewed literature where they, they, they looked at, okay, what are the habits and practices of elite level natural bodybuilders? Mm. BCAAs are right up there in, in the top four, along with, I think it was protein powder and I think a multi and some other stuff, maybe a pre-workout, but they've just been marketed so incredibly well. Yeah. Starting stellar. From, <laughs> if you want to learn about marketing, study study oh, that. Man. BCAA's marketing. Uh, I mean, it really was very strong in the early two thousands, early to mid two thousands, when uh, I, I think it was Cyvation, <laughs> <laughs> a, uh, a company called Cyvation by a friend of mine. Just in 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 the uh, the same vein that mm. um, I accidentally started a monster with the IIFYM thing. Mm. They're here starting the the BCAA monster, or certainly you know pushing the momentum of it. But here's the thing that BCAAs are, are kind of unique in the area of s supplements that, that truly don't work, but are marketed really well mm -hmm. in that it does have a sound theoretical basis. Yeah. So, so essential amino acids, the nine of them, uh, they're required for life and health and growth. The, of the essential amino acids, the three branch chain amino acids, so leucine, valine, and isoleucine, mm -hmm. those are considered the prime anabolic driving amino acids. Mm -hmm. And of those three, leucine seems to be the king mm -hmm. <laughs> of uh, the ringleader yeah. of anabolic processes. And so, okay, why don't we take the three most anabolic amino acids and supplement with them mm -hmm. and then just drive anabolism. And you know what? There are short-term studies, there are um, uh, immediate response studies on muscle protein synthesis showing that branched-chain amino acids do spike muscle protein synthesis. Mm -hmm. And so based on those short-term studies, we uh, once again, we make the leap that, hey, all we got to do is just supplement Load with branched-chain amino yeah. acids and then watch the muscle grow. But in fact, there's two studies now, um, longitudinal or chronic studies, studies that are carried out over enough time, a period of weeks or months where you can measure these outcomes that we're really interested in, like changes in body composition, muscle mm. size, strength, no effect of um, branch chain amino acid supplementation when your total <laughs> daily protein intake is 1.6 grams per kilogram and up. Mm -hmm. And it kind of makes sense because when you take a look at the dietary protein sources, they're somewhere between on the low end, like 15% uh, to the high end, like 25, 26% mm -hmm. branched chain amino acids. So, I mean, whey would be at the top there. I was going to say, yeah. 26% of whey is branched chain amino acids. But 
all of the other protein sources in the diet, particularly the animal sources, with the exception of something like uh, gelatin, you know, okay. are going to be high in the branched chain amino acids. So you're already getting what? a bunch of dietary BCAAs, hence the, the meme of... You know, yeah, they didn't say that on the bottle. Yeah, the, whole, the, pouring. It's the bottle pouring while you're in in the pool, or or turning on the sprinklers during a rainstorm type of yeah. Idea. So I was gonna say, so let's spell this out for because people are like, okay, so if I'm not getting 1.6, I should take BCAs. <laughs> no, what should you do if you're not getting 1.6 grams? If you're not getting 1.6 and you're insisting on taking a supplement to cover that gap, you're much better off. Not not even taking a, a full spectrum um, essential amino acid, but a high quality, <laughs> intact protein, uh, like like whey. It's going to be less expensive. I was gonna say even just cost per ratio, it's insane. Yeah, it's insane. You're, you're getting branch chains plus with whey. You're getting branch chains and EAAs plus a bunch of other cofactors that will contribute to growth, and health and immunity. And uh, you know it, it's just. It's a no-brainer. Okay. I want to spell that out clear because I'm like, people are like, okay. But that's what that's what makes more sense. Yeah. And the cost ratio, the amino supplements now are like $40, 50 $60. Yeah. It's yeah. outrageous. I mean, you've do, I've been doing this for over 15 years. Yeah. How often does something come across your desk that really grabs your attention and you say, okay, this is going to be where my time goes this month? Yeah. It's naturally ends up being a almost a selfish thing. <laughs> like... What's going to benefit me in my life? <laughs> <laughs> um, I love it. So the whole idea of time-restricted feeding mm -hmm. and the hype train be behind time-restricted feeding has really built up to just a fever pitch within the last few years. Mm -hmm. And so intermittent fasting as, as a general practice, like with its different, you know, subtypes, mm -hmm. has been a hot thing for like, the last 10 years and only yeah. be, becoming hotter, right? Yeah. And so I, I recently wrote wrote a paper on this. I collaborated with my friend Brad Schoenfeld. This uh, was just a few months ago, yeah. right? Okay. Yeah. We wanted to collect all of the all of the research, all of the data on how intermittent fasting affects body composition. And we wanted to draw a comparison between intermittent energy restriction versus daily caloric restriction. And it was a fun project because intermittent fasting has different types, different, distinctly different types. Yeah. There's same thing. Yeah. Same conversation we had, right? With artificials, which one? Yeah. Yeah. So we, we got to look at fasting, each one. Yeah. And the main types, there's three main types. There's, there's alternate day fasting, mm -hmm. which has its own sub variants of like strict zero calorie alternate day fasting. Mm -hmm. And then the Christoverity version where you, you consume about 500 ish calories on your in quotes fasting days mm -hmm. and that's every other day is every how that one day. typically goes that's right and then there's twice a week fasting or the five two yeah method. i was like that's probably what's best known as right five two yeah but we didn't say five two in the paper because apparently that's like a trademarked uh you know okay name, name yeah like so <laughs> okay. it's a brand so yeah the peer reviewers are like uh, could you please not call it five two i'm like all right man we call it twice weekly fasting <laughs> And it was pretty cool because yeah. we were able to come up with this TWF acronym. It makes it sound kind of Okay, cool. that's cool. Yeah. So twice weekly fasting. And then there is um, like consecutive day fasting. Mm. You know, so, so you've, got, you've got those types of things. Oh, well, wait a minute. Five, two, alternate day. I was going to say, well, is there a time-restricted feeding? Okay, the timers, are, the 16-8 is the most popular method. But like the time-restricted, right? Where you have an eating window, like a fed window and a fast window. Right. Consecutive yeah. day fasting. We... We didn't cover that because then you'd have to talk about everything from 48 hour fasting to a 40 day water fast where people are never just, it's open. You can't close that. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Can't tie not on that. So the three major types, alternate day fasting, um, twice a week fasting and um, time restricted feeding. Mm -hmm. So the it's a very interesting area of research because across all the studies, there is a, a relative abundance show of studies showing that ad libitum intake with intermittent fasting. So ad libitum meaning unrestricted intake. Mm -hmm. So you're not purposely trying to diet on the feeding days or the feeding windows. Okay. Still results in <laughs> weight loss. Wow. Which is pretty awesome when, yeah. when you think about it. That's a that's a breakthrough finding and that's a breakthrough approach. And the hype around intermittent fasting deserves the accolades in as much as on your feeding phases you truly are not restricting. 
you truly aren't dieting. Now, of course, everybody knows a couple friends here and there who could really mess that up. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I could even on a few days here. But just at a general population level, it, it works. It works. Mm -hmm. and, and that's kind of the beauty of intermittent fasting. Now, the other thing is a lot of people are afraid about muscle losses with, yeah. with fasting days and whatnot. Uh, we don't see this with time-restricted feeding. Okay, that's what I was going to ask you specifically because I'm like, I've seen this and it's the biggest threat I think a lot of people see to it. It's like, okay, for weight loss, awesome. What about the muscle bees? Mm -hmm. So time-restricted feeding, you're not seeing it as much. But yeah, tell me what happens when you open that window more and yeah. more. Yeah, yeah. Time-restricted feeding plus resistance training mm -hmm. has been a special area where we not only do not see this sort of threat to lean body mass loss, but we see superior effects in, in fat loss. Okay. In the time restricted feeding plus resistance training group compared to the the conventional linear dieting group. Okay. Uh, Grant Tinsley and his group have done a lot of that research, which is really interesting and really eye opening. Now, there is research on lean subjects who are not resistance training and doing alternate day fasting. Okay. And they lost more lean body mass than subjects who were doing daily caloric restriction. So without in both the, groups, neither groups were trained or training. Neither groups were training. Okay. okay. Yeah. So the resistance training piece is key to making sure you're getting the benefit out of you know this time restricted feeding thing mm. or any of the other intermittent fasting variants. So you okay. need resistance training in there. And frankly, uh, a lot of the the research in this area is not optimized for macro macronutrition and. There's gonna not, be, those pieces are missing here. Yeah, those pieces are missing, but it is an interesting thing. But overall, overall, just big, you know, aerial view of it, intermittent fasting is nothing special for body composition improvement compared to daily caloric restriction. It's on par with it. Mm -hmm. So those who are obsessed with intermittent fasting and thinking it's the the messiah, it's gonna make me live forever. Humanity. Yeah, cure cancer. It's gonna make my hair grow longer. It's gonna make it like, yeah. No, that, that's just not true. Mm. And as I dug through the body comp literature on this, I found um, the, the first long term study comparing and with time restricted feeding the the star now or or the the darling as it were of of the media is early time restricted feeding where you get to torture yourself and stop eating at 4 or 5 p.m., right? Mm, okay. So that's supposed to be the, the ticket. Well, <laughs> <laughs> this long-term study by Liu and colleagues, L-I-U, drew out a time-restricted feeding group where they ate from 8 to 4, compared it with um, a conventional dieting group that ate from 8 to 8. Okay? okay. So they added 12-hour versus this, this... I think it's 8-hour, eight eight yeah. Eight hour. And... No significant differences between groups in all the parameters tested, including cardiovascular risk factors. Okay. So it's like, you know, no better insulin uh, sensitivity yeah. and glucose control, no better blood lipids. Either way, they both put they put both groups on a moderate caloric deficit as, you know, nothing, nothing extreme. Mm -hmm. And lo and behold, the early time restricted feeding did not show any magic. Yeah. And so now we're thinking, okay, well... Maybe we're just right back to program the the diet according to individual preference and what they can actually adhere to in the long term because that's ultimately what matters. Mm. Okay. I was going to ask, in the study where they, they noticed that there was really no, no difference in loss of lean body mass, has there been any particularly looking at building muscle mass? So maybe not in a calorie restriction, a restriction way. Has there been any research comparing the two? Time restricted on if you can gain as much muscle mm. in even a time restricted window versus no window feeding. Yeah, not yet because okay. what they would have to make that a hyper caloric condition where by the end of the week they netted. Yeah, I was going to say it would be so. difficult, but I was like, I wonder if there's something there because that's the, again, it's in my head, the mechanism piece mm -hmm. that would make sense, but I'd always wonder how that would play out when you actually look yeah. at it, you know? I mean, in theory, uh, you're just compromising your ability to, uh, to gain muscle over time mm. with an intermittent type of uh, restriction model, even time restricted in theory. Uh, now the body is really resistant. You can it can grow muscle on uh, any kind of wacky program you throw at it, but growing it optimally yeah. is probably going to involve optimizing rates of muscle protein synthesis every day, mm. and then those those micro anabolic events if they're maximized 
over the course of weeks and months, then you'll probably end yeah. up with more muscle and if seems, you're not compromising MPS. Yeah, and I was like, it almost seems like it's this, it comes back to the conversation of casual goals versus what level do you really want to yeah. take it to, right? That's what kind of that's what it sounds like at least a little bit. Yeah. I was like, is that what's kind of grabbing you more? Is like the the time restricted feeding windows and the everything that keeps coming out. Usually, when that comes across, does that grab your attention a little bit more? I mean, it does. Be, being in the the, the bro meathead, um, mm -hmm. you know, category. <laughs> yeah, of course. I know that's why I'm like, let me ask about this muscle. I got. That's what I. <laughs> that's what I want to know. You know, be, being a bro, yeah, absolutely, it does. And and so we generally, um, you know, taking a muscle centric approach to longevity you know, mm. to health, uh, things that compromise muscle protein status or things that compromise lean body mass retention are always going to be kind of looked at with sideways and cautiously. Mm, okay. And let me, I was going to say this because with the SD card running out and Tony being a terrible savvy, I do want to ask you this question. Sure. Because this has fascinated me as I've grown, because I'm always learning new things about myself just in growing through this, probably like through your career, you've probably learned a lot of different things about yourself. I've noticed the the most I've ever learned about subjects, the like the, the quickest speed that I've learned uh, something new is when I've had to teach it to somebody else. So for example, putting the podcast episode we did a while ago, spending the time to dig deep, go through the outline, the research on vitamin D. I've never learned as much about that subject versus when I had to actually go through it as I was going to relay that information. Your book that you came out with last year, Flexible Dieting, was later in your career, right? Like much, yeah. much later in your career. Yeah. Did you go through any of that writing that book where you learned more than you had at other specific points in your career about any certain topic? Yeah. 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 I'm trying to think of which one it would be. <laughs> well, I was going to say, because it is it, your, your book, like it was, it was a perfect playbook to sit, to really kind of show where people's attention should be going. Mm -hmm. So it'd be difficult, but that's what you learn so much in how you, when you learn someone else is going to be reading it, you're like, okay, I have to say this in a certain way. Right. Yeah. Especially, I mean, especially with what you're used to in like the research review, it's like, okay, the book, well, cause I was going to say, who is your intended reader for the book? Did you have someone in mind? Like, this is the person who I want to read this book when you're writing it or did, was it more just, I want to get this information. Yeah. How that kind of went about. I, I wanted, okay. The, my target was the person who says, Hey Alan, what is the nutrition book that's like evidence-based that would teach me what I need to know as a, as a fitness coach or a trainer. Mm. Or um or a dietitian working with the healthy population. Mm -hmm. Like what 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 book, okay. what's the go to book for that? And my background is basically uh non clinical yeah. <laughs> nutrition. Mm -hmm. you know, nutrition for altering body composition and improving athletic performance and mm -hmm. the health piece is is a lot of times it's inevitable mm -hmm. in there. And so that book really wasn't out there on a on yeah. a massive scale and i have this own obsession with um with research and 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 you know being able to gain a working level of science literacy or scientific literacy mm. to to be able to kind of guard yourself from the bs that floats around the media yeah. and not get had <laughs> in the multiple ways that you can be deceived by, mm -hmm. by the media messages and stuff so i wanted to include that in the book as well Okay. Yeah, that was my audience. I mean, I, I really, honestly, dude, uh, it's like, I just wanted to write the, an evidence-based nutrition book, wh which included all the stuff that I thought was super important for um, coaches and practitioners and, and just really highly interested enthusiasts who don't mind reading. Did you learn more about who you thought you were writing it for in the first place? The more you were writing it, did you learn more about the audience uh, from that point of view? Not really. Not really. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah. Okay, that's yeah. surprising. Okay. And any of the topics in the book, because it, it was, the title of the book was Flexible Dieting, right? So really breaking down all the ends there. Was there anything that you changed your opinion on pre to post writing that book? Or did not much change? A couple, couple, couple little things. A couple little things. So during the, during the course of writing that book, uh, you know, you've got this, this study coming out by Hevia Lorraine et al. Matching protein at 1.6 grams per kilogram of body weight, putting uh, untrained subjects through resistance training protocols and then measuring muscle gain and mm. size and strength. And so no significant difference. And so before that study, we would normally say, all right, um, we have to make sure that, that vegans are eating X amount more protein mm. than omnivores to put them on a level playing field. 
But that study really kind of uh, shifted the the thinking. Was it coming out too, just as you were writing it? So you're it like, was, son yeah. of a, <laughs> I gotta, gotta <laughs> rethink this out. part. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's coming out. And so, um, it, even in the book, I, I recommend it. I, I think it's a 15 to 30 percent more protein for vegans versus omnivores. If the main goal is mm-hmm. muscle gain, mm-hmm. um, I would probably dial that back to 10 to 20 percent at okay. this at this point, just to be you know. Given okay. the evidence, but I still err on the side of safety. Yeah. Okay. So it's changed a little bit. Yeah. Uh, timing wise, it's always funny. Cause I know when and going through when you have to, to edge it, but I'm like, I wonder what if that comes the same towards the end of your career versus more in the mid or the beginning or when those shifts kind of happen probably for you as you were going through everything. Which I'm sure yeah. going through the starting your your business with the research review, mm-hmm. I'm like, I bet that learning curve was <laughs> steep. <laughs> that yeah, was going sure, up, right? Yeah. That was always big. Uh okay. So I think Tying a knot there. I'm not going to lie. I think I had more fun on this one. But that also might be because you're sitting right next to me. So I, was, <laughs> I don't know if that's a little biased or not. Uh, but I think we should probably wrap it up there. But I was going to say, okay, and I don't know if you like people, like your best representation of you. I think social media is great. Your research review, I can't speak highly enough about. But I'm like, even the book, we were talking about this before we even started recording or anything like that. I'm like, it's very rare. I don't know if you see this, but it's very rare. I've noticed like a book can be just as helpful for who you made it for dietitians coaches things like that just as helpful for them but also translates to be equally as helpful for someone who is not in this field at all and could still take just as much out of it maybe not the same exact pieces but take just as much away from it i haven't noticed a lot of writings to do that i think honestly most like a bigger leaner stronger with mike matthews i think he did a phenomenal but you don't see that often Mm -hmm. So I was like, even though we recommend, like, you probably recommend the book a lot for who you wrote it for. I was like, even if you're just sitting here and you're like, just, do you actually care about your health and want to get a a grip on it? I would say educational standpoint, I would point people almost to your book first. Mm. Would you say that's the best representation of you? Or where would you say, if you want, Alan, where would you go? I, I, I would have to agree. You know, I think about the book and I think about the research review. The research review is this sprawling and, uh, segmental, like, like you know, millipede of, of information, whereas the the book is sort of this one stop shop that that gives mm-hmm. you just solid and relatively timeless, uh, beneficial information. Mm-hmm. Like a lot of the stuff in the book is not really going to change much. I mean, no. because uh, it's stuff that has worked in my personal practice uh, since 1990, and it's it does have everything current with the research literature that. A lot of it moves at a slow pace. So yeah. You're, so you're, if you're, changes you're, are being made, they're not significant changes. They're not significant, and um, and thank God because uh, writing that book was a hell of a. <laughs> yeah, you have to rewrite every five years. You'd be like, this is not going to work. Yeah, no, <laughs> this is not going to work. Okay, yeah, I was like, well, it's because it's more principle based and coming from the understanding point of view, not that this is the way to do it point of view, right? Yeah. Like I think that's those things are just kind of more timeless. Okay, I was like, I don't want to misrepresent you, but I'm like, that's where I would say. Most people could get the most out of it. Okay, so I'm glad we lined up. I'm glad we lined up. So is I, there any? I final appreciate th- that you. I appreciate that you like the book. Oh yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, I, so I wish. I, like, I think I was telling you. I think even just emailing before we even even talked for the first time, I was like, "This is just." I'm like, I wish it was required by coaches or by these things, like as a just source of education before getting into. The, like, I wish it was a requirement, kind of a thing, just because of what was provided compared to what else is provided out there. I'm like, and I think that's what we, I think that was even before we talked, right? Yeah. It was like, we're working on that. Right. It's not VGF, but right. we're working on it. Is there any final notes before the ST card dies? Do you want to throw on? I, I, I want to plug my research review yeah. because it captures what I'm interested in at the moment during the month. Mm. Uh, you know, coincidentally with, with International Women's Day when I dropped the, the last... Uh, yeah, Wait, was it really? Okay, I remember. I know exactly what I you're talking about. I wasn't planning on I it. didn't know the dates lined up perfectly. Okay, okay. Yeah, I was not planning on that. But different issues that, that float around in, in the scientific space are captured in the research review. Mm-hmm. And you're going to get the most current stuff from me through the research review. Okay. So I think that's what the... I, w- I would point people towards... That as well. Towards that, Yeah. yeah. Yeah, for especially for people who are not prone to reading a three hundred page book, you know. Excellent point. <laughs> and yeah. So you'll get little pieces of it um, monthly about what what's going on. And I'm not so 
big of a star that I don't answer emails and, and DMs mm. and stuff. And so he answered my email for <laughs> that was the first. Luckily, I think I is that how I first I think I first read I, no I think I, it was a DM or something. It was a DM. Yeah. It was a DM, and you waited. I made you wait months, but yeah. Well, Consistency and is and key. now look at him. He's in this entire this huge building. He's no, <laughs> <laughs> right? No, I I totally yeah. appreciate it, and I totally appreciate everybody listening to this mm. podcast or watching this podcast, and I appreciate you and the way that you're pushing the field forward. It's always it's always great to see the good guys doing good things. So. We try, <laughs> try our best. Yeah. Us and Mariana, who's here in spirit, not dead. She's in the sky right now in the plane, but Mariana. here in spirit. We miss you, Mario. Okay, perfect. I love it. I think it's a perfect, perfect cut. 